While the two great empires were fighting a bitter war, to the south of them the Prophet of Islam Muhammad was preaching his new religion. By 630 he had successfully united most of Arabia under his control. Muhammad died in 632 and was succeeded by Abu Bakr. Although most of the peninsula rebelled against him, the new caliph was able to restore his kingdom in 633. Abu Bakr launched an invasion against lands beyond Arabia during the very same year. Eastern Syria, Western Iraq, and Central Jordan were all conquered and became the foothold for the next phase of his plan, the invasion of Palestine and Syria. This region was a weakness in the Byzantine defenses. The local population was often disloyal for religious reasons, and Roman rule was just recently restored after the war against the Sassanids. Historically, these lands were usually invaded by the Persians from the east, so the defenses to the south were lacking. In 634, Abu Bakr ordered the invasion of Palestine and Syria. His plan was to take control of these provinces and cut the Byzantine Empire in half. Emperor Heraclius still considered an attack from the south to be unlikely, and only left local garrisons to defend the region. The first battle happened on the roman sasanian border at Faraz. Arab forces then moved to Palestine where the Roman garrison of Gaza was handily defeated in February. Heraclius then reacted to that and sent a larger army to the center of the region, Caesarea Maritima. The best Muslim commander, Khalid ibn al-Walid, who previously operated in the Sasanian territory, joined the army. In June and July, he defeated Ghassanid forces and then the united Byzantine Ghassanid army led by Heraclius himself, while taking only minimal losses. The central battle of this campaign took place in August at Einadine. The Byzantines lost more than 10,000 men, along with the ability to defend Palestine. The Muslims now controlled the countryside, but weren't eager to attack any of the coastal cities since the Byzantines still led an overwhelming naval advantage. Arab forces moved to the north, slowly taking over the land. Heraclius traveled from Emissa to Antioch and started recruiting a new army to stop the invaders along the Yarmouk River. However, Muslim forces were moving too fast, and soon Basra and Tiberias fell under the pressure. Enemies were now in the vicinity of strategically crucial Damascus, and Heraclius sent his armies to stop them. Unfortunately for them, Al-Walid defeated the Romans twice and besieged Damascus. Sources offer differing versions of the events, however, either through an assault or betrayal, Damascus fell at the beginning of September. The death of the Caliph slowed down the invasion, as his successor Umar demoted Al-Walid, but the new Muslim leader still wanted to conquer Syria, and at the beginning of 636, the most important city of central Syria, Emissa, was occupied. Aleppo and Antioch were now under imminent danger, however now Heraclius had five armies under his command and also agreed on a plan with the Persian Shah, Yazdegerd III, to launch a simultaneous offensive. For the first time, Byzantine forces dominated the Muslims numerically, and although the Sasanians failed to start their attack, Heraclius decided not to wait. His plan was to either fight four Arab armies separately, or at least push them back. Despite the fact that Al-Walid was not the commander anymore, he was still respected, and this new general took his advice to abandon Emissa in Damascus. Initially, Muslim forces decided to defend on the Yarmouk River, but they were forced to withdraw to the plains beyond it. The Byzantines and Arabs held their positions for almost three months. There were attempts to negotiate a ceasefire, but they broke down. And finally, both armies engaged on the 15th of August. The number of troops is still contested by historians, but it seems that the Byzantines outnumbered their foes two to one. However, some estimations are too fantastic. There are claims that the Romans had 400,000 men, which seems extremely unlikely, as in the previous war against the Sassanids, Heraclius was only able to muster around 40,000. Even if recruitment lasted for a year, the Byzantines wouldn't be able to field much more than that. We know that the Arabs had around 15,000 during the Siege of Emissa, but were joined by forces raiding Palestine and reinforcements from Arabia since then, so it was probably more like 20 to 25,000 strong. 
The leader of Byzantine Sea was Armenian General Vayan. He used gas and did light cavalry under his command as a screening and skirmishing force. Armenian infantry was in the center, flanked by mercenary foot soldiers to the left and Greek infantry to the right. Infantry was a mix of skirmishers and melee warriors. Each of these groups were backed by cavalry lines, consisting mostly of cataphracts. The commander-in-chief of the Muslim army was Abu Ubaidah, but he allowed Al-Walid to lead during the battle. Al-Walid divided his infantry into four groups, with three cavalry squadrons behind them and a bigger cavalry group in reserve. Arab troops had lighter armor, but compensated that with a higher mobility. It should also be said that the Roman army was international and multi-confessional. The Arab army, however, worshipped one religion and consisted of one ethnicity, so the latter had a substantial edge regarding morale. Both sides considered the plains to the east of the Yarmouk River favorable, as the Byzantines relied on their numbers, while the Arabs felt that mobility was their real strength. On the first day, the elite warriors on both sides dueled each other, and it is said that the Muslims won most of the battles and killed many rival officers. At noon, Vayan sent one-third of his infantry forward for a reconnaissance action, and in some areas began pushing the Arabs back. But most of the army was ordered to not attack at all, so this initial success did not last long. Eventually, units returned to their original positions. During the Muslims' morning prayer at the dawn of the next day, the Byzantines attacked. Vayne's plan was to tie down the enemy center and use a numerical advantage on the flanks. After some struggle, the Byzantines succeeded on their left side, and their enemies had to retreat all the way back to camp. Sources claim that camp followers and even the wives of the Muslims joined the defense, and that allowed the defenders to drive the Byzantines back. The Arabs also had to retreat on the left, but eventually took back most of the lost territory, as Al-Walid led his cavalry to the area. The Byzantine plan had failed, as the Muslim reserve counterattacked their center, and they had to retreat to restore the front. The third day started similar to the second, as Vane's left flank was able to get an advantage and killed many Muslims, but Al-Walid restored the formation by sending his cavalry reserve to the right. The number of losses the Arabs took was much higher than that of the Byzantines, so Al-Walid understood that his defensive tactics were bound to end in defeat and tried to come up with a new strategy. The Byzantine leader was sure that his tactics were working and decided to attack the left once more. And as in the previous days, his forces were able to drive the enemy all the way back to camp. This time, the right center group of the Arabs also had to retreat, and it seemed that the breakthrough would happen soon. Al-Walid had to save the day. He ordered his left and left center to attack and tie down the opposition. As the Byzantine left and left center advanced too much, they had no one to defend their right side. Al-Walid would take advantage of this, send a group to attack there. The Byzantines took many losses and had to retreat to avoid encirclement. The Arab right and right center had its share of casualties, but it held off the opposing forces. Vayan decided to ask for a ceasefire on the fifth day, but his counterpart empathetically declined, as he was sure that his army was on the verge of victory. Instead, Al-Walid sent a cavalry squadron to secure the closest bridge, and now the Byzantines had no way to retreat. He concentrated his remaining cavalry on the right flank. On the sixth and the last day of the battle, the Muslims were ordered forward. When the infantry engaged, Al-Walid attacked the enemy cavalry and infantry from the flank and rear. The Byzantines still had an advantage in cavalry, but while theirs were spread throughout the front, the enemy riders were concentrated. Vayne's cavalry was crushed. The Muslim right succeeded in their battle against the Byzantine left, as the later were attacked by the cavalry from the rear. Soon these troops attacked the Byzantine center, and that was the end of the battle. As the closest bridge was now under Arab control, many Byzantines among them, Vayne, was killed during the retreat and there were more than 25,000 casualties. 
The Muslims continued their invasion. In the next decades, they took Syria, Egypt, and North Africa from the Eastern Roman Empire. And even Constantinople was besieged on multiple occasions. The Romans never returned to these lands, and the Muslims still hold dominion over them today. Thank you for watching our documentary on the Battle of Yarm. We hope that you enjoyed it and we'll be happy to hear your feedback and get your likes. If you share this video, you will help us quite a bit. I am Commissar Bro, narrating for Nurik and Phoenix, and we'll catch you on the next one.